Um, so let's just go over a few things uh, before we get down to the nitty gritty of wavelength calculations. Uh, I'd like to go over a few items uh, with you concerning this last week of classes in the final. First of all, uh, the last day, of, for, for, for you newbies, freshmen, the last day of semester classes is Monday, next week, a week from yesterday. Now for us, our last lecture is this Thursday, so make a note of that. You don't have to email me or message me and say, web courses, Dr. B, do we have lecture next Tuesday? The answer is N-O. Do we have lecture next Thursday? The answer is N-O. This Thursday is the last one. Now that being the case, SI, we've got a bunch of SI coming up. Um, and let me rearrange the uh, SI schedule here for you so you can... This is really how the last four SI sessions um, stack up. Yeah. Uh, oh, gosh. So... <laughs> Okay, last semester, last day of classes for everybody's Monday. Our last lecture is Thursday. SI schedule. Now, this is the normal SI schedule that I have uh, in various places, but this is really how it stacks up for this week Thursday, Friday, and then Monday and Monday next week. Now, Monday and Monday, you'll have SI, regular SI sessions, but our last lecture is this Thursday. So you'll have plenty of time to work out uh, different concepts with Miss uh, Maria. All right. In addition, SI final exam review. Oh. Hold on a second. Uh, SI final exam review is Tuesday, um, next to, so a week from today. Uh, midday, 11.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Now, uh, for those of you that are newbies, Tuesday um, is study day. So there's no classes. There's no zip zap. But there is SI final exam review. Now, Miss Maria has a, a nifty review sheet for you. She's working on. I've already taken a peek at some of it, and uh, she's going to have a, a, and she'll be releasing that um, in the next day or two. This she'll be releasing it Friday, so uh, that'll be good. Now the other thing that we have coming up uh, that I know everybody's interested in is special study groups. The second round is designed to go um, at the end of this week and up into next week. And it is designed to get you ready for the final. Now, special study group leaders, I want if you're in here, I want you to get me your special study group information. Um, and I want to make a small change. Instead of starting to uh, Thursday uh, at 4 p.m., I want you to have your SSGs somewhere between Friday at 4 p.m. this week uh, and Wednesday. So that's a small change. Uh, Thurs uh, instead of Thursday uh, this week started at Friday or you know after that or sometime between then and, and Wednesday night and that way we'll accommodate all the sections that need to take the um, exam all right the location uh, special study group leaders you can use a different location if you want um, you know if you were in the library last time you can use uh, uh, the study room at Hercules. Is there a study room at Hercules? Some kind of a community room or whatnot. Uh, or someplace over by the towers, the arena. You know, somewhere on campus. can be anywhere. Hopefully somewhere where you don't get rained on. All right. Meetup location before your meeting. I want you to make that really plain. I had some students, uh, some SSG leaders last time say, oh, Dr. B, I'll just meet in the benches in front of the library. Unfortunately, there's like a zillion benches in front of the library. And it's a small group, so you're, it's, and if you don't know the leader, it's, you, you, you might be high and dry. So make it a little more specific than, than just that. 
Same thing with identifying features. I had a SSG leader say, well, I'll be wearing sweatpants. That doesn't really help much. because There's a million people wearing sweatpants. So um, now, uh, when I get all that information, the rest of you guys, um, uh, I'll be putting it on the new schedule page. All right. So matter of fact, you can look at the new schedule page already, but there's only one person in there with an actual meeting time. Okay, she's kind of ahead of everybody else. Uh, but we'll give, be getting more people in there. Um, and uh, it'll, it'll look kind of like last time. Except we have one more day. We have Wednesday that we can use to get ready. Or, I, yeah, we can get Wednesday. Um, and signups will begin. I should make a clicker question of this to see if you guys are actually listening. So, because I had students, Dr. B, I couldn't get into a sign-ups group. I didn't get in there in time. All right? Well, if you, if you have time on Thursday night at 9 p.m., you can get in there before the stampede. All right? So uh, pay attention to that. All right? Sign-ups will begin at Thursday night at, at uh, 9 p.m. again. All right? Now, uh, last comment to you before we get back to quantum principles is that uh, Darian and Caroline and I have a ton of grading that we're working on, homeworks and this and that. Um, and we're gonna, and I know that all of you are kind of antsy about where your grade is and stuff maybe. Uh, and I'll try to get as much of that information posted and up to date this week. And by the way, your last regular homework is going to be Thursday night. And you'll have homework tonight, a little bit. Um, and uh, a, another ho regular homework Thursday night. And then also on Thursday night, you'll have a study review. And it's kind of a mega review. And I'll convert that one, not into regular points, but into um, uh, bonus points. Okay. Also, in Thursday, we'll have um, a... I think we'll have a clicker review session in class uh, and uh, using our clickers uh, for the last half hour or so of class. And uh, you'll use that. And, and, and then that'll be converted into bonus points. So you get some bonus point activity. So even if you can't get to an SSG, for whatever reason, you can still get some bonus points on the books and help yourself out uh, in a nice manner. Okay. But be alert, but also be patient. Right, because like I'm not. Rome wasn't built in a day. So, questions. Yes. Wait a minute, May second. What are you reading the syllabus? Oh, man. Is that right? Is that what the syllabus says? On the syllabus? Good. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Good. Good work. Yeah. So, may, yeah, it's right in here. And I believe it's at 10 o'clock. And uh, so, not 1030, but 10 o'clock. So, so don't be half an hour late. Be here at 10. Uh, and, and, uh, Try to be happy that you do not have a 7 a.m. final. As who's got anybody in here got one this semester? Oh Lord, it's been nice knowing you. <laughs> I hate those things. I don't know why they do it, but anyways, that's what they seem to do. I I don't have one this semester, thank God. But okay. Uh, only half of the Campbells have a 7 a.m. Oh, yeah? Both of you? Yeah. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Can't be helped. Uh, anyways, last time we talked about the de Broglie hypothesis that electrons behave as if they're waves. And it was kind of a revolutionary conjecture on his part. But in the early 1700s, and even back in those days, there was a debate, a similar debate about light, 
light itself, does light behave as a particle? Or does light behave as a wave? And there were experiments to, to show that, yeah, it's a particle. And there were experiments that definitely showed that it's a wave. So people were, you know, riding two horses with, with light. And it turns out that de Broglie thought that the energy levels um, of the atom, specifically hydrogen, could be comprehensible um, if you treat the electron as a wave. So let's take a look at some of this stuff. So for instance, this and we used this picture last time of kind of squiggles around Oh, oh my cursor, I don't have my big cursor. Um, we have squiggles around uh, the center of the atom, the nucleus. The nucleus is not really depicted here, but the ground state, the innermost state uh, for the uh, for the atom is like the fundamental mode of the coil spring demonstration that Darian and Caroline did that one day. Okay, there was one frequency that if Caroline, uh, excuse me, Darian um, oscillated the spring at just that frequency, it would set up a standing wave, and the standing wave was twice the distance between, and th that was the wavelength. You know, a set wavelength for the fundamental and a set frequency. And Darian had to get that frequency just right. And if she did, she'd set up that, you know, bump oscillating to a dip, the fundamental mode. Now, in, in terms of atoms and quantum field theory, we call that the ground state. But it's similar that, you know, one frequency and one wavelength. Now, the next energy level up, the n equals 2, is similar to the first excited state when Darien and Caroline were doing the demonstration. And that was a little, even tougher to get because it was a, a higher frequency that Darien had to use to generate the right waves. But if she didn't get that right frequency, it was all jumbled and, you know, scrambled up. It didn't look as all discombobulated. But once she got to just the right frequency, bang, she got a standing wave. Set frequency, set wave like the same thing with n equals two. Now with n equals two, the, the, the second excited or the first excited state in the coil spring, n equals two state in the hydrogen atom, uh, higher frequency, smaller lambda. All right? And that's important for us. All right. And what we're going to find uh, in Thursday's lecture is that when you have two atoms coming near each other, the waves will um, interact, uh, the electron waves will interact and form a, a, what we call a covalent bond. You'll have constructive interference. If the atoms are arranged just the right position, just the right angles, you'll get constructive interference. And if you don't, you don't get constructive interference. The atoms will rearrange until you do. And when you get constructive interference, it'll be a covalent bond. Now, this behavior is something that we know is true for musical instruments. So there's no great shakes about atoms. The whole, the whole thing is, well, okay, if... if Uh-oh... I have a question. I have a clicker question coming up. Get your clickers co co coming out. You know, the, the big breakthrough conceptually was um, uh, Louis de Broglie say, well, let's think of the electron as a wave. But once you do start thinking of that as a wave, it's, it's a lot like, a, you know, a, a guitar, a musical instrument that has vibrations. You know, another cool one to think about is um, raise your hand if you drum. Anybody here drum at all? Okay, if you do any drumming, you know that the drum head is basically uh, kind of a, a what we would call a circular membrane. And if you hit it, it'll oscillate. And if you and the oscillation modes of the drum head they look differently than what we see with the coil spring, of course, because it's a two-dimensional system but it'll have different oscillation modes. It'll have a fundamental mode and it'll have excited states 
And uh, so any kind of a musical instrument usually is going to have certain frequencies because of the design of the, of the instrument. Okay, so a guitar, so on and so forth. All right, now, next question. Can you go to the document cam for a second? Because I think I forgot to, yeah, I forgot to animate this. Okay, I have a mental, I'm going to give you a verbal question now, all right? I'm going to give you four, and the reason I'm doing this verbally is because I forgot to animate it so you can see the answer on the slide here. So I'm not going to let you see the slide until I give you the answers. Okay, um, which of these is a version of Newton's second law. So this is multiple choice. Okay, A, delta V over delta T. B, one half AT squared. C, F delta T equals delta P. D, E equals MC squared. Go ahead and write them down. I'll go through it again. A, delta V over delta T. Is that a version of Newton's second law? B, one-half AT squared. Is that a version of Newton's second law? C, F delta T equals delta P. Is that a version of Newton's second law? And D, E equals MC squared. Okay, go ahead and vote. A, B, C, or D. And hopefully... And I'll, I'll just go through them again. A, delta V over delta T. B, one-half AT squared. C, F delta T equals delta P. D, E equals MC squared. Which of those? Oh, man, this is good that I'm asking you this question. There's a lot of you getting it wrong. Ten seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, <coughs> seven, six. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Show this. Please. That is pathetic. I'm not happy about that. Now let's go go to the regular display, please. <laughs> Only one this should be like automatic. But it's probably because you, verbal instead of visual is, is difficult. Anyways, write down F delta T equals delta P, that that's a version of Newton's second law. Okay, it's kind of a review question. You should have gotten it right. I'll animate it for the second lecture. and they'll, they'll probably do a little bit better than you guys. We'll give, we can't give everybody points on this. Uh, that's all right. We'll figure out a way to deal with this. Don't worry about it. All right, so let's talk about the second and third law uh, interactions. So here's, here's Newton's second law, F net, error, F net delta T equals delta P. And we know that this law applies to both objects that are interacting. And the medium or the um, coin of the realm for interactions is momentum, delta P. So even though the forces are different and the delta T's are different, what we really talk about as being uh, the same are the delta P's, the changes in the momentum. Now, in the atomic sense, the force involved is the Coulomb interaction, right? And delta T and delta P, and delta P is where de Broglie's um, hypothesis comes in. And that's because he said, look, um, let the wavelength of the electron be computed uh, based on the Coulomb interaction. And then therefore the momentum of the electron using Planck's constant H. And he said, let lambda be equals H over MV or H over P. I mean, this thing is, she's blazing me up. Messages. Um, yeah, so the Coulomb interaction controls the momentum state through F delta T equals delta P. I mean, that's one way to look at it. 
That's what Sir Isaac Newton would say. And then de Broglie says, all right, once, I, once my, my interaction strength, you know, proton to electron, or maybe two protons if it's the helium nucleus and the electron, uh, or six protons for the carbon nucleus, you know, for each of the electrons around the carbon nucleus, um, get momentum, and then, you, and then de Broglie says, um, use lambda equals h over mv to figure out the wavelength of that electron. And de Broglie said, yeah, that'll work. And he, he said it perfectly explains um, what we've seen about, for instance, the spectrum of hydrogen. Now, here's the hydrogen spectrum that we looked at last time, h alpha, h beta, h gamma, h delta. Okay, and this is kind of an idealized photo. It's, it's a nice photo of it, um, and I've added some notations to it. But, um, yeah, we were able to view, I think everybody saw H alpha and H beta, and a few of you saw H gamma and H delta. They were kind of faint. Um, and so what we want to remember with this is that those wavelengths are controlled by the energy and momentum of the electron, the dynamical state of the electron. And that is controlled by the Coulomb interaction. And the Coulomb interaction is typified by the charge of the nucleus and the charge on the electron. It's a pairwise interaction, so it's electron interacting with the nucleus. Now, um, all hydrogen nuclei are just one proton. All helium nuclei are just two protons and maybe a couple neutrons, but they don't interact electromagnetically with the electrons, only the protons do, right? So this Coulomb interaction controls all this. So getting back to our formula here, um, the Coulomb interaction uh, encodes the interaction uh, between electron and nucleus. And then the momentum state encodes as a wavelength and a frequency. Now the formula for the for the wavelength is particularly easy. Lambda equals h over p. All right. And this is the conjecture uh, of de Broglie, and he worked it out. He said, you know, if you, if you make this conjecture, the hydrogen atom makes sense. It all works. Using lambda equals h over mv, it all works. Okay, it all fits in together. All, you get all your constructive interference and, and all that kind of stuff. It all works. But now, the, the question that we ended class with last time was specifically this. All right, you have an electron. And you say, all right, this electron particle also behaves as a wave. That's as comprehensible as a bookcase that is also a horse. All right, it doesn't really make sense, but yet that seems to be the way nature does it, okay? And so if, if it's really true, then you might ask yourself, can an electron display diffraction effects? Because particles can't do that. Now, here's a picture of ocean waves diffracting, all right? Those ocean waves, there's a little gap in that uh, headland that rocky outcropping, and the waves diffract through the gap in there. Now that's one single gap. If you have a diffraction grating, yeah, light waves, like, like what we had on uh, Thursday last week, um, yeah, diffraction, light diffracts. It, 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 and the diffraction grating is a grating with a zillion openings. You know that picture from the ocean? That was just one opening. This diffraction grating is a zillion openings. And yes, it'll disperse the light. So remember that word I used last time, dispersion? There it is. We're dispersing the, the different wavelengths of light. So the question is, do electrons do that? And what can you use to cause electron dispersion or electron diffraction? And the answer to that is, you can use crystals. And... In 1927, these two guys, uh, Davison and Germer, the uh, two Americans, they observed electron diffraction. 
Okay, and here's the modern day version of what it looks like. Okay, this is an image of a beam of electrons not going through slits like the diffraction grating, but going through a, a, a panel, a very thin uh, set of nickel crystals at various orientations. Okay, and so you can see that the, and where the, where this image is bright, there's a lot of electrons hitting the detector. So this is like a, uh, this is like a cathode ray image. Okay. So, um, and I, I challenge you to go and look at this in um, YouTube. Boy, nobody's looking at this. Everybody's looking at their computer. Eh. Uh, sometimes you guys frustrate me. The only way to understand this is to look at it. Yeah, it's a visual thing. You can't, just reading about it is not going to, you got you to gotta look at it. Look at those rings. So the, the electrons don't just go straight through. They don't reflect back. Well, some of them do. But the ones that go through, they diffract out left and right. And this one's not, this one doesn't have the same symmetry. This one is not oriented up and down, you know, like, you know, what we did with the diffraction grating. So you don't have left and right or up and down. You have all directions. So you have bright rings instead of two bright patches left and right. Okay, and so that's what these rings are. And from them, can you see those little notations up there? Look at it carefully. Look at it carefully. Are you looking? Or are you looking at your computer? Come on. All right. I see you guys not looking at this stuff, and this is all visual. Okay, now, if you see up there the letters FCC and then the letter N, you know what that means? And it's actually NI. You know what that means? Face centered cubic. All right, FCC. So go ahead and write that down FCC, face centered cubic. And then the, the symbol NI for nickel because that's what you're looking at. Davison and Germer were looking at nickel crystals, uh, and so they found it, and this is what uh, some modern-day guys, and this is from 2011, uh, and they've got it, uh, nickel crystals kind of encapsulated by carbon, um, FCC and I, and so they have uh, four different um, looks at face-centered, cubic crystal arrangements for nickel. All right, now I want to do some calculation with wavelengths using lambda equals h over p. So let's use, uh, let's get Planck's constant. And here's the two versions that you better write these down. And we're going to use these and get your clicker ready because we're going to have a clicker question here in just a second. You're going to do, we're going to do one together, then you're going to try one. Okay, um, so Planck's constant. Now, in the metric system, uh, joule seconds, uh, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. It is uh, really teeny. Um, and, you know, if you're trying to figure out the quantum wavelength lambda for a macroscopic object like a baseball or even a blood cell, uh, something that you can see in a microscope, yeah, you could use this version. The other version is in electron volt seconds. That's over here, and that's for submicroscopic objects. In other words, stuff we can't see, like electrons, protons, and molecules. All right? And we're going to use that one. All right? Now, uh, I want you to make notes carefully on this calculation we're about to do. And then I'll let you try one uh, with... Uh, I think I got a baseball coming up. So let's do an electron together. And we're going to use this second version of Planck's constant, 4.14 times 10 to the minus 15. All right. Here we go. So I'm going to use this uh, value for the momentum of the electron. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 4 electron volt seconds per meter. 
Now that's the unit of momentum. Um, you know, the, the, for atomic level systems, electron volt seconds per meter is good. For um, atomic level systems, energies, electron volts is good. You know, the hydrogen atom, 13.6 electron volt binding energy. All right now, a couple notes about this. You may think to yourself, oh, big deal, Dr. B. Uh, momentum 1.6, that's boring. Let me get back to Facebook. All right. But what it means is that the, <laughs> that the uh, kinetic energy is 2250 electron volts. All right, so it's, it's buzzing. It's blazing. Okay, that's a good couple thousand electron volts of ki kinetic energy. Um, its speed is, and if you work out the speed, uh, which is not that hard to do, but anyways, I worked it out this morning before class. It's about 9% of the speed of light. So that's realistic for an electron in an atomic system buzzing around in there, 9% of the speed of light. Half the speed of light is, is now you're talking about a really fast electron. We could do that too. We can get electrons up to 99.999% the speed of light. But 9%, yeah, that's, that's realistic for an atomic system. So let's try this. Lambda equals H over P. All right, so go ahead and write down your formula. And we'll plug in what we know. And in the numerator, uh, we're going to use the electron volt seconds version of Planck's constant. 4.14 times 10 to the minus 15 electron volt seconds. All right, and that's actually a unit of Angular momentum. It's kind of cool. All right. Now, if you look at those numbers, the, the numeric part is 4.14 over 1.6. So that's going to be about, I don't know, 3 point something. Actually, it's going to be less than 3. It's going to be 2 point something. Okay. Because, let's see, 4.8 divided by 1.6 would be 3. So we've got 4.14. So this is going to be 2 point something. Yeah. All right. So that's 2.58 something, 2.59. And then my, my scientific notation, my powers of 10, um, 10 to the minus 15 in the numerator, 10 to the minus 4 in the denominator. So my 10 to the minus 4 in the denominator is like 10 to the regular 4 in the numerator. Okay, so 10 to the minus 15. 10 to the 4, that gives you 10 to the minus 11. All right, so here we go. And hey, you guys, everything, the numerator and the denominator both have electron volt seconds. Okay, there's electron volt seconds. Let me get my cursor over here. Come on, cursor. There we go. Uh, electron volt seconds up here in the far right side of the numerator. Um, and then... In the denominator, I've got electron volt seconds per meter. Now, per meter in the denominator becomes regular meter in the numerator. Right? And that's what I've got down here in my second line of the equation block. Okay? I've got meters, regular meters in the numerator. So that's all copacetic. Let me pause for questions. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, work it out, it's 2.59 to three significant figures. Uh, 10 to the minus 11 meters. Uh, hey, you guys, is that bigger or smaller than a nanometer? Remember what a nanometer, what's the, what's the power for a nanometer? 10 to the what power? Not 10 to the four. 10 to the minus 9. Okay, so 10 to the minus 9 is a nanometer. Is this smaller or bigger than a nanometer? 10 to the minus 11. Smaller? That's right, it's smaller because it's 10 to the minus 11. It's even smaller than 10 to the minus 10. It's smaller than 10 to the minus 9. So this is 0.0259 nanometers. 
So if you, so for instance, if I'm, if you're in doing homework, yes, you'll do something like this in homework, um, and I'll ask you to convert to nanometers. This would be 0 0.029 or 0 0.0259 nanometers. By the way, you guys, when you're on your clicker, which we're going to do in a second. Always, and if you have zero point something, 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 always type in the zero and then the decimal point. You can't start an answer with a decimal point in iClicker. And I, I'm pretty sure you can't do it in web courses either. It'll discombobulate. Now, electron diffraction patterns can reveal a whole lot. And scientists look at these for instance, these three patterns that you see, this is looking at specific crystals, okay? Not a, not a collection of crystals. So this one doesn't have rings. This one has dots, very specific arrangements of dots. And so what this tells you is that you're looking at these different configurations of this crystal um, shape, all right? In other words... When you see this bottom pattern, it means you're looking at the crystal in this orientation down here. All right, can you turn the lights all the way off? I want these, these crystal shapes or not. All right, so that you can see those crystal shapes a little bit better, okay? Uh, and so um, th the different orientation, you shoot the electron through, and it'll produce these different patterns in black and white on the left, okay? So looking at those patterns, you can determine the orientation of your crystal. So it's a pretty good, uh, a pretty good analytical tool, electron diffraction. Okay, go back to regular presentation mode. All right, now we're going to do a calculation together. This one's going to be a macroscopic object. All right, so I want you to clear some space in your notebook. And I want you to calculate uh, the wavelength using the de Broglie relation uh, for a paper clip with this much momentum. 2.65 times 10 to the minus 3 kilogram meters per second. Now that's a normal, that's, that's a walking pace. It's a macroscopic object. You know, a paper clip's about one gram, they say. Most regular size paper clip, jumbo paper clip's probably a little bit bigger. All right. Now, I want you to calculate its wavelength. And what I want you to do, go ahead and start it, um, is type in your answer. Uh, oh, hit the refresh key on your calculator. Okay. And you'll come up with text entry. Now this one, I want you to type in scientific notation. So type in the number, and then a space, and then E, and then minus 11, or whatever the wavelength happens to be. Right? So if you have 1.807 times 10 to the minus 11 meters, then type in 1.81, E minus 11. All right? And for this one, use uh, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 Joule second. And that'll give you a wavelength in meters. Okay, so take a minute uh, and jot this stuff down, and I'll turn the lights up. All right. Can you still read that okay? All right, I see some answers coming in. Um, I see some of you putting in E equals 31. Be careful. What I want is E and, and a minus sign, and then, you know, whatever your exponent is. 33 or 31 or 
27, whatever it comes in. It's going to be a minus. I mean, that's good. I guess we can designate which ones are correct. I think so. That's cool. It is nice. Good. Symphony of clicking. Huh? So the symphony of clicking. The symphony of clicks. Many clicks. <laughs> it's synonymous with brains clicking. Elizabeth, have you figured out your new place and time and so forth? Yeah. Good. Did you send it to me yet? Um, this Is it going to be the same? Did you talk to the students in your group? Well, I mean, after the test. Yeah. I wonder how, if they felt it was helpful. I hope so. Probably was. Usually it is. We, we, we've studied it in the past. And the students that go to SSG, they do better on the exam, too. So they get bonus points. Plus, they, you know, instead of getting 30, they might get 33, you know, on the test. Don't forget your selfies. Those are always, I always get a kick out of those. You weren't in the semester with, we had this one guy. He was so, he was really hilarious. And his SSG, um, his, his selfies, I, don't, I, I wish I could have gone to his SSG to tell you the truth, because his selfies, they always looked like they were having fun, and like they were very mischievous. And they'd be in the library, and they'd have all these, they'd pose, you know, for his, his, his selfie and stuff, and it looked like, now what are those guys doing? You know, it, it was always funny, that That's guy. Funny. Yeah. But actually, they all, they all look really good, usually. Uh, I want three significant figures, not just two. Okay, 30 seconds to get your, to change your answer or get it right. Oh, oh, I don't like that one. I see somebody with two decimal points. Oh, that looks nice. That one looks good. Let's see if I can designate that. Yep. Somebody's got, if that's really, if one is that thin, that means somewhere else here we've got. Oh. So, I don't know how you I don't do know why that thing is so touchy. <laughs> Caroline, go get that guy. Go get him. Nah. All right, go ahead and click and okay. there we go, kind of. All right, uh, go to to presentation. Raise your hand. Okay, go uh, go to my yeah. Okay, raise your hand if you got 2.5 times 10 to the minus 31. Good. And I can now go to the dis the computer display. We can see that. Now, don't do anything yet. Okay. Um, look at where's the. Look at this one here. Now, for those of you, oh man, yeah. Here we go. Look at this one. 2.50 times e or e equals 31. 
All right, now, I would mark that wrong on the test. Maybe if you do something like this on the test, you would maybe get two points instead of three points. Because obviously you're, you're, you've got the calculation right, but you didn't type in the, you know, you got a little typo there. Now, the other thing I notice over here is 2.502. See this guy right here? Uh, that's incorrect. Didn't type. So you got to type in your, come on, baby. How do you, you gotta get the little sparkle? The little sparkle? Yeah. All right, good. Ooh. All right, that's good. That's good. All right, now this guy, I would give two points to 2.502e minus 31 because he didn't round off properly. Here's the here's guy, 2.502e equals 31. And you guys, now this one's good, 2.50e. Um, E minus 31. He's got an extra space in there. Here's another. See, wow, 18 people voted for this version. Holy buckets. It's, you know, I, I agree. It's, it's the eye clicker. It's like, it's very hard to make, especially the decimal point. So that's why I try to be merciful on these. But, I mean, I don't know. I've... I think it should be easy to distinguish an equal sign from a minus sign, but this room, I don't know. Maybe. Oh, yeah. yeah. So okay, yeah, that's right, because the curse, yeah. All right. It's kind of a, yeah. Poor design. All right, let's go to the regular display. All right, so, um, so go ahead and make a note. 2.5 times 10 to the minus 31 meters uh, for a paperclip going a few miles an hour, uh, and hey, you guys, uh, that is an extremely small wavelength. Now, the key for, for observing diffraction is that the wavelength and the opening in the gap, you know, the gap size from one side to the other, they have to be, you know, maybe 50%, you know, uh, or maybe the same size, or maybe one's double the size of the other. This one, the, the problem with this is, this is many powers of 10 smaller than your pocket, all right, or the doorway, or any container, macroscopic container that you could think of. And for that reason, you're not going to observe diffraction of, uh, effects for something macroscopic like a paperclip. Let me repeat that. Because the quantum wave, it does have a quantum wavelength on the order of 10 to the minus 31. But that is so much smaller than the actual object and so much smaller than any device that could contain it or any aperture through which it, could, it moves, um, you're not going to see any diffraction. All right. It ba the waves just basically go through the opening. They just keep going. They don't diffract left or right. Now, when you have wavelengths of light, visible light, through those diffraction gradients that we had Thursday, yeah, the, the, you have a, a lot of the wave energy goes straight through, but then you have some that diffracts off left and right. And those are the different colors that we saw on Thursday to the left and to the right. Okay, and that's because the grading size was just right to catch to produce diffraction effects for Roy G. Biv visible light. But if we tried to use that with a paper clip, you know, forget about it. All right. And the things that we do have, you know, the pocket that's a that's a containment device for a paper clip uh, or a box of paper clips, too big, way too big. Power, orders of magnitude too big. All right. Now, let's talk about the dynamical state of an electron interacting with the nucleus. I said um, earlier in lecture that you can try to grade this. Just, uh, <laughs> Caroline? Yeah. Uh, just give all these mm -hmm. one. Give all these. Yeah. Even though they have this. Uh, Equal, yeah. Okay, yeah, just be be merciful. Mm -hmm. 
Caroline, be merciful <laughs> to my students. All right, so let's talk about the dynamical state of the electron. Um, energy levels are controlled by the Coulomb interaction, and we have a need for constructive interference in accordance with Planck's constant H. Yep, and we just calculated some wavelengths. All right. Um, and he here's the third thing, and we'll br just bring it back to what we saw Thursday. All those wavelengths and stuff are revealed in the diffraction lines that we saw. Now, that H alpha, that red H alpha we saw on Thursday, that's a photon of light. That's not an electron. That has a different wavelength. But the energy levels are created by the need for constructive interference. And then once you drop an energy level, so you drop from one wavelength to another wavelength, the electron, then the photon outgoing has a set amount of energy, and therefore, because it's a photon, a set color and a set wavelength. Right? And we saw that for the um, for the for the uh, H alpha line in hydrogen. And you can see diffraction lines for all the other elements. And a lot of times they'll be invisible, but if, you know, sometimes they're in infrared and x-ray. So, gosh, I got a lot of people trying to send me messages here. Sorry about that, you guys. I should turn off my, let me turn off my phone. Hold on. Because I don't have my power cable today. Yeah, that's better. All right. Uh, now, the angular momentum state is also... Uh, one of the dynamical variables for the electron. So for the electron, we think of it as spinning, right? like a little planet. You know, like the Earth is orbiting the sun, so it has an angular momentum, an orbital angular momentum state, and the Earth is also spinning on its axis, so it has a spin an orbital angular momentum state. Same thing with the electron, okay? So it has orbital and spin angular momentum. And those lead to fine details. Those are also dynamical variables that affect the energy levels. And we can see those tiny effects, uh, not in lecture hall, but in the lab we can see those tiny effects. You know, like when we turn on a magnetic, powerful magnetic field. So you put your hydrogen uh, tube in between, the, in between a big, the poles of a big horseshoe magnet or a big electromagnet, turn on the electromagnetic, and you'll see uh, tiny differences. Okay, so the angular momentum state, uh, and we'll talk more about this on Thursday, that actually affects the shape of the molecule. So the energy level and the angular momentum state of the electron, uh, they, ex they control the wave, the electron wave, and the fancy term for it is the electron wave function. So go ahead and write that word. It's all one word. Wave function. W-A-V-E-F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N. The electron wave function. And it's just our, our word, a fancy word for the, the formula for the shape of the electron wave um, around the atom. And if you've had a chemistry class before this, um, you've seen uh, pictures of the different orbitals uh, of the different atoms and stuff. And I'll try to show you some pictures of that on Thursday. Now let's get back to the periodic table. Periodic table encodes all those dynamical variables, angular momentum and energy. Right? And as I've mentioned before, one of my favorite periodic tables is uh, webelements.com. Um, here it is. This one is the one that I, I highly recommend. Let's talk about elements um, in general. Uh, what are they? You know what I love about this picture? Almost everything that you can see in this picture has hydrogen in it. And a lot of it has is hydrogen and oxygen, water. The clouds, water. The snow, water. The sun over there, and the, man, this, I wish these projectors were in better shape. 
Uh, the sun over here on the left, that's, this is a sunrise, uh, is just a gigantic ball of hydrogen producing light because of hydrogen fusion. The pine trees in the foreground, uh, hydrocarbons, carbs. So now we've long thought about the universe as being built up of basic building blocks. And one way to think about it is how much hydrogen do you see in this photo, All right? The guy that first started um, the whole idea of the elements of nature uh, was Thales of Miletus. He was a, a Greek um, mathematician and philosopher. Uh, and this is the artist's conception of what he looked like. Nobody knows what he really looked like, but, um, you know, so this is a picture of some Greek dude wearing a toga. About 600 B.C., he was the earliest one, and everything traces back to him. His, and I remember reading about this when I, was, when I was an undergraduate. His idea was that everything was water. That the, everything in the world was a form of water. And he had, re, you know, he lived Miletus, that's an island in the Aegean. And so he's surrounded by water. You know, he probably lived... You know, he probably went out on boats and stuff, fishing and stuff. And, you know, to go to the mainland, they had to go through boats, sailboats and stuff like that. So he thought about water a lot. And that's what his opinion was. Now, by the time of Aristotle, a little bit later, a little bit lower number of BCs, um, Aristotle uh, thought of, the, now these are the classical four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. Okay, and so Aristotle said, well, Thales, yeah, I think you've got the right idea, but I think, Thales, it's actually four. Okay, water, but also earth, air, and fire. Earth, wind, and fire. Okay, and so that was Aristotle's. Now, in the 1800s, um, the scientists had kept working on it, and they got up to about 60 elements. So they knew that carbon was an element and that oxygen was an element. By the way, the word atom is from the Greek word uh, meaning uncuttable. A means no or, or anti. T-O-M uh, means to cut. Now you may think to yourself, Dr. B, what are you talking about? Well, if you have an appendectomy, what gets cut out? Your appendix. T-O-M-Y is the, you know, that's the medical suffix for cutting off, you know, so you get a brainectomy, they cut your brain out. You know, that happens every year at finals week, or it feels like that. But appendectomy, you get your appendix out. Uh, what else do they do? Something else. Anyways, anything with a T-O-M-Y is a, is a, a cut. A surgical operation. So Adam means something that you can't cut. And in the, in the 1800s, they, they, they were convinced, okay, lead is, is an element. It can't be cut down to smaller units. Copper can't be cut down. Copper sulfate, well, they knew that that was not an element. All right? Um, aluminum oxide, not an element. Aluminum, an element. Oxygen, an element. Water, not an element. Because water can be broken down. So make a note of it. Um, water is not an element because it can be broken down by electrolysis. If you run an electrical current through water, you can break it down into oxygen and, and, uh, and hydrogen gases. That's how we, and that's how we get oxygen. That's one of the ways that we get oxygen to this day and uh, hydrogen. Just electrolysis, a little bit of electrical current, and you can break it down. So, so the, the chemists of the 1800s would have said, okay, Aristotle, we're work, and, and Thales, we're working on your problem, but we've shown that water, nope, it's not actually an element. It's made up of two elements, hydrogen H and oxygen O. Now, today we have over 100 of the elements. Okay? Now, the guy that um, conceived of this thing uh, as indestructible atoms was named John Dalton. And I, ha I'm go I have some reading for you in additional reading 
considering that, and I'll, I'll put that in the homework. You could do a little reading on John Dalton and some of the other guys. Um, and that is related to the, the idea that it's a substance that can't be cut down any smaller. So hydrogen can't be cut down any smaller. Now, to, uh, you, you know, we've kind of locked onto John Dalton's definition of elements. And really what we should call them is chemical elements. Because we now know that hydrogen actually can be cut apart. You can ionize hydrogen and get the, jam that electron off into infinity and you're left with a proton. A carbon atom, you can break it. You can even break the nucleus of the carbon atom. You can smush two carbons together and form a bigger nucleus. Right? So technically carbon in, in, in terms of uncuttable is not true, but we still um, uh, retain that uh, definition of the chemical elements. Now, let's talk about molecules. If you remember from that movie, The uh, Fellowship of the Ring, they were attacking, what was the name of that city? Uh, Gondor, the city of Gondor. And uh, they use this big battery ram, Grand. Now there's this cool Latin phrase, Grand Apognat Molibus Urbum. Go ahead and write that down. Apognat Molibus Orbum, Urbum. That's related to the word for molecule. So moles. M-O-L-E-S, in the word molibus, means shapeless, huge bulk, like grand in the movie and in the, in the, in the book. Okay, so opugnat molibus orbum literally means the huge bulk that attacks on the city. Urbum, that means city. Opugnat, that means fisticuffs. Okay, so you're attacking the city with a huge bulk. All right, now that is where we get the this this huge bulk moles is where we get the word for molecule because the suffix c u l e means small tiny bit of a huge bulk. So a molecule is a small tiny piece of a huge bulk. So if you look up and here's here it is at dictionary.com. Cool. You look that up, and that's what it means. All right? So a molecule is a small part of the shapeless bulk. All right? That's what molecules are. Here's a picture of, uh, this is a bottle of the NH3 molecule, ammonia. And see these two dots up here? Uh, go ahead and sketch. Where's my cursor? Come on, baby. There we go. All right, see these two little dots up here above the blue part of the molecule? Those are there for a reason. It's not a typo. All right. Now, one of the things that we want to talk about is the atomic mass unit. All right. And ignore that page reference. That's from the old textbook. Um, the atomic mass unit is officially designed to be a twelfth of the mass of the carbon-12 atom. Now carbon, here's its slot in the periodic table. It has six uh, protons in the nucleus and it has 12 uh, objects, most uh, carbon anyways, has 12 objects in the nucleus. So six protons, six neutrons. All right. Now you may say to yourself, Dr. B, what is this business. If carbon is supposed to be officially 12, how come the periodic table lists 12.011? Well, there's a few variations of carbon. Here they are. The carbon nucleus, here's the, go ahead and make us, I don't know, you can make a sketch of this, I guess. Carbon 12 nucleus, it looks kind of like this. Kind of a bag filled with six protons and six neutrons. All right, now let me park that over here to the side. Right. Now, there's another version that we find in the universe, a stable version of carbon, and it's what we use for carbon-13 dating. Okay, It's called carbon-13. And this one is six protons and six, or excuse me, seven neutrons. 
total of 13. So we call it carbon because of six protons, but it's carbon 13 because there's actually seven neutrons in there, total of 13 units in the nucleus, and so it's slightly heavier. So F equals MA works a little bit different on a carbon-13 atom than it does on carbon-12. That's how you can, you can separate them based on that. All right. Now these are called isotopes of carbon. That means they, they have the same chemical structure, the chemical behavior is the same, but their masses are a little bit different. Okay. Another isotope, carbon-14. Now there's just enough of them to make the... Um, the total mass of carbon in the periodic table a little bit higher than 12, 12.011. And that mass number in the periodic table um, reflects the mass of carbon found in nature. And you can find carbon-13 and carbon-14 in nature. They're pretty rare, but it's just enough Excuse me. Oh, it's just enough to uh, budge the, the mass of carbon up to 12.011. Okay, back to molybus. Okay, now water. Oxygen is oxygen 16. Most water in the universe, in, on our planet, is oxygen 16. But we do have oxygen 17. And we do have oxygen 18. And those are isotopes of, hydro, uh, of oxygen. And we can find any glass of water you drink is going to have a few molecules of water with 18s and 17s. Okay? But basically, most water is uh, 16 units in the oxygen and another two in the hydrogen. All right? Now, we use the atomic mass unit to define something in the metric system called the mole. Now the mole is the huge bulk. So what we do in the, in the metric system is say, all right, my molecule, my tiny bit, has 18 ma atomic mass units. So how many, how many molecules are there in 18 gram units? Not atomic mass units, but metric gram units. So if I say that I have 18 grams of water, how many are there? Well, it turns out that that's one number. It's called Avogadro's number. It's the same for every substance. So for instance, water has a mass, uh, an atomic mass of 18 AMU, and therefore 18 grams of water has 6.02, 2 times 10 to the 23, uh, H2O molecules, and you'll be able to read about this in the additional readings page. Um, second concept, um, carbon. 12 grams of carbon, pure carbon, 12 grams of it, is going to have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 uh, uh, atoms of carbon. Uh, so you can say that this number is called Avogadro's number, and I'll spell that for you, A-V-O-G-A-D-R-O, Avogadro, after the Italian chemist who figured, who conjectured that um, the same amount of molecules would um, have the same physical bulk properties, mass and so forth. And you can read about it in an additional uh, reading page. Let's try another example. Silicon dioxide, also known as silica. All right. Uh, let's figure out the mass of 6.022 times 10 and 23 of those molecules. Uh, by the way, what is silicon dioxide also known as? Sand. Also, when you heat it up and melt it and then re-solidify it, glass. 
You know, so the glass that you, uh, you know, buy something at the grocery store is, is sil usually mostly silicon dioxide. Okay, so let's look at oxygen. Silicon dioxide, there's two oxygens. So 15.99 times 2. All right. And then silicon, we just got one of those. So you look that up on the periodic table, 28.086. And you just add them up. And uh, that works out to 60.084. So one mole of silicon dioxide, SiO2, has a molar mass of 60.084 grams. Go ahead and write that very sentence down. All right? And that's a good sentence that defines the entire, and this whole slide defines the entire idea of molar mass. And we're using molar mass to mean the, a huge bulk of it. Now, uh, 60 grams of, of silicon dioxide is just a little chunk. It's not, a, it's not a huge grand bulk mass, but anyways, we, we're going to call it a big mole, a big bulk. It's, it is a huge number of, uh, of uh, molecules, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. And 10 to the 23 is, let's see, uh, 10 to the 23 is, okay, 3,000. Six million, nine billion, twelve trillion, fifteen quadrillion, eighteen five trillion, twenty one six trillion. So this is a hundred six trillion, six point oh two two hundred or six oh two. 0.2 sextillion molecules. That's a lot of molecules. Right? That's how tiny molecules are. All right. For homework, um, look in web courses tonight. We'll have a, a small and most. It'll mostly be doing wavelengths and maybe a few molecular concepts. Okay, you're dismissed. I'll see you on Thursday. Make sure to bring your clicker. Special study group leaders, you can come up and talk to me if you feel like it. If you don't feel like it, that's all right.